In autumn, paddies under the temporary dwelling made of rushes. My sleeves are wet with the dew. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Anime Research Group, a show about the weird and wonderful mistake that is anime. I'm Ian. I'm Danny. I'm Freya. And this week, in our quest to watch all the shows we never had time for, we look at Classmates, or Dokusei. But before we get into talking about Dokusei, we should say what we've been up to. I've not been up to much. Uh, I've been trying to get some work done and mostly failing, so I've not watched any more anime. The only thing I have done is finish Psychonauts 2, which is now one of my candidates for Game of the Year, together with Resident Evil 8 and Great Ace Attorney Collection. It's just such a wonderful game. And also, since I talked about this with Freya recently, one of the very few games in which both of the main protagonist's parents are alive, talking to you, and don't die during the course of the game, which was really really surprising that I couldn't think, we couldn't find any other example of this happening. Good game. Good game. Generally speaking, as anime fans, we are pro-parent death. <laughs> mm-hmm. Or at least parents' parent absence. I've also not been up to much. Uh, I've been keeping up with Kageki Shoujo because it's great. But uh, I've the other stuff I've been watching from the season, I'm quite far behind on. I'm like six episodes. I, actually, who knows with Love Live because that's been delayed twice. Um, I'm like four episodes behind in uh, Aquatope because I was just crab posting today. Crab posting is very important. Crabs are great. Everyone All hail the cram. Uh, but me and Denny did get together the other day and watch the first four episodes of oh, uh, yeah. Archer Season 11, which I'm very nervous to see where they're going with that um, because it looks like they're trying to do a reset season and bring it back from the implied character growth after his coma amongst the other characters and just bring it back to the normal uh group dynamic and that's a very very bad idea <laughs> to be fair the writing itself was actually it felt quite good while we were watching it i definitely feel that we were laughing a lot more than we were during the last few seasons at least on, on a minute to minute basis the last season certainly because the last season wasn't great but no. i do think it's not snappy like they they do that thing where they tell the joke that's a cut between two different scenes and it was just it really felt um like punctured we'll see how that goes indeed how about you freya i have gotten on a train for the first time in two years and then slept in a different house for the first time in two years yay whoa it was fine Mm -hmm. as we say i haven't slept in another house since covid started but that's not true i would love to say that we're getting back to normal in the uk but that is (laughs) hilariously false Okay. <laughs> I know I'm sad. Uh, Danny, please tell us about Doki Say. The movie was released in 2016 and serves as an adaptation of the first arc of the Doki Say manga by Asumiko Nakamura. It has been running from 2006 until today and is divided into seven separate parts, with, of course, this adapting the first one. This 60 minute movie covers the five chapters that comprise the first part called Classmates. It was directed by Shoko Nakamura, who's worked on plenty of stuff that Freya will cover later, but this is their first time directing a movie. It was also animated by A1 Production, of course, famous studio for, among others, Sword Art Online, Working, Your Lie in April, and, best of all, Hypnosis Mike, Rap Battle Division. A show that I really wanted to be fun and then didn't watch because I wasn't into it. It was occasionally funny. It was fun to begin with. It was fun when it ended. Sort of. Let's not talk about the middle part. A1 Production is one of the massive glom of companies that seem like they're different companies but are just a different facet of Sony. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we are going to be just referring to this as docuse rather than classmates. Yeah. Um, but this sort of is an interesting thing because the seven parts all have different names like Sorotohara and whatever. And it's just like, I think I think people just think of it as the Dokusei franchise, but like it really needs like an official franchise name. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know what you'd call it. I haven't read the other part of the mangas. But that's not important. Let, let's just go to the summaries. 
Okay, since this is a relatively straightforward manga to anime conversion, uh, I'll just just break up the summaries by chapter. Um, Also, I'm just going to consist, I think we should just consistently refer to people by their last names in standard Japanese style, Uh, but for one reason that I'll get to later. So the first part of the movie is titled Summer. We have Rihito Saijo and Hikari Kusakabe. They're in the same class at boys' high school, and that school is preparing to hold a choir festival. And during one of their music lessons, Kusakabe notices that Saijo is not singing along with the rest of the class. He's been struggling to read the board due to his glasses, but he doesn't want to bother the teacher, Hara-sensei. So Kusakabe volunteers to help him learn the song in private in after-school lessons. These continue for a while until Saju is getting everything right, and after the final lesson, Kusakabe drops a bottle of water, and as they both reach out for the water, he gives him a smooch before apologizing and rushing off. Um, the next day during the choir festival, uh, Kusakabe is watching Saju sing, and he starts to cry and rushes out of the hall. Saju chases after him, and outside, Kusakabe tells Saju that he loves him, and they kiss in the gym shed while the teachers look for him. The second part is called Winter. This chapter is about sort of a misunderstanding and its fallout. At the beginning, Chris Akabe is chatting with a friend in class. The friend recurs, reoccurs multiple times throughout the movie. And he asks if there is something between him and Saijo. Quote, not that I mind, but you know, there are rumors. Saijo overhears this conversation and is understandingly quite upset. And he later on avoids Chris Akabe's kisses and tells him we're not going out and starts to ignore him at school. Hara-sensei notices that they've been fighting and asks Saijo if they're going out, uh, which he, of course, mostly just talks around. Hara then says that Kusakabe isn't like them, meaning himself and uh, Saijo, and that he'll eventually start chasing girls. But as Hara goes to kiss Saijo later on in the in the bit, Kusakabe runs back into the room, uh, hits him in the head, and then runs out with Saijo. He then proceeds to apologize to Saijo and asks him out again, which this time Saijo accepts. The third part is called A Complex Fool and a Simplex Fool, which is a maths reference. Um, Structurally, it's similar to the last chapter. Uh, Kusakabe invites Saijo to see his band, Zagok, performing in their last ever show. Uh, When Saijo goes there, he by accident orders a beer and later gets drunk. And after the show, there's a girl who is trying to ask Kusakabe out, and they exchange numbers, which upsets Sajo, and he runs off and doesn't answer his phone a bunch of times. Uh, Kusakabe tracks him down at a park. They uh, make up, quote-unquote, um, and kiss, and there is some spine fondling, and Kusakabe assures Sajo that he is his number one. Ichiban. Uh, the final part is the second summer, so quite a lot of time has uh, advanced. And it's now summer vacation, they're trying to organize their plans. But Saju is very busy with summer school, and it seems like they're not going to be able to meet. Kusakabe gets very frustrated by this, and he's sort of like, why isn't our relationship progressing? So he's like, alright, I'll go talk to Harasensei. And while they talk, Harasen lets slip that Saju has been planning to go to university in Kyoto. And this leads to another fight, and Sajo and Kusakabe decide that they're not going to meet for a while. Over the break, Sajo goes to Akita with his friend for some fun onsen times, and Sajo gets to be boring and study. So finally, it's the day of his entrance exam, and Sajo is riding the train, and he's thinking back over the argument, and he's starting to feel very sick. Kusakabe calls him, and he's Sajo is like, no, I'm, I'm getting off the next stop. And there's... He starts to hallucinate and dream that Kusakabe is there, but when he wakes up, Kusakabe is there. And he drives Sajo to the exam and waits for it to finish. And then after the exam, they make up proper they make up properly, with Sajo taking the lead for the first time. The end. Za endo. <laughs> it was a nice movie. That's all we have to say. Goodbye. <laughs> Why are you doing your D D character voice? I don't know. So you've noticed that there are only three names. Uh, there is technically a name for um, for uh, Sakabi's friend, but we'll 
He's Kusakaba's friend. He's not really much else. So it's a good place to start with. And I think it makes more sense to start off with uh, Hikari Kusakabe. Mm -hmm. Uh, Since, at least to my point of view, he's the point of view character through which we see and experience most of the movie. Yeah, that's right. Uh, The first first half, sure, he gets a bit more modelled later. I I, I kind of get what you mean. Um, I don't think the third part is pretty much entirely Sajo's point of view. That's true, but we do have him... He's the one who introduces us to the world and the characters. Yes. Then for for the first half of the movie, then we have one bit of Saijo and then we have them together in the final bit, I'd say. Yeah, I, I yeah. think part of the reason I think of this is that is that when it comes to Saijo, he's like so straight laced and <laughs> boring that like none of the stuff with with him is like amazing in the way that we get like the silly aunts and stuff um with uh, Kusakabe. I mean, we only ever see him interact with one other character outside of um, Kusakabe, which is Hara Sensei. He also talks to his mum in one scene. I guess that's fair. For about five seconds. <laughs> what do we know about uh, Kusakabe then? He's like very happy go lucky. He's just like taking life as it comes to him, not really worrying too much about it. He's so- blonde. <laughs> his hair is amazing and we'll get back to that in a second yes uh, he's um, in a uh, he's in a band he's the guitarist uh and he occasionally smokes those are all the superficial descriptors we can really ascribe to him he later gets a motorcycling license yes apparently it does because this this movie does take place over the course of at least one year because later on he says they've been dating for a year but they're still just kissing and nothing else yeah, he's uh, he's also a little bit oblivious in some ways. They both are, in, in a certain manner of speaking. Well, yeah, and that's... Uh, yeah. So, um, well, this is a, a short BL film, um, so I guess one of the questions we have to, like, confront is, like... <laughs> did he know that he was gay? I don't think he thought about it too hard. <laughs> I, I would agree. I don't think he thought much about love in general. His friend states during the onsen that he's dated girls before, but that he's never fallen in love before. So I think it had less anything to do with gender and more just with with Saijo himself. The reason I do this is just that he's very much a dark around Saijo from the first interaction onwards. Um, like... Even like I think his face in like that scene when he just notices that Sajo isn't uh, singing and like how he re- and how he like it's not really asking him. I was just like, but I could help you sing if you want to, you know. I do feel like there is an element to love on, of love on first sight with this, or at least fascination. I wonder if there's an element of him kind of representing a the rebel side of the supposed student body due to his like. Stand brightly colored hair that stands out from the crowd. No other student kind of looks like him. And then there's uh, Saijo, who's this straight laced, black haired, glasses, uh, straight A student. So I'm wondering if there's like a little bit of a fascination on his part of seeing this supposed straight laced student not actually singing in class and just kind of mouthing along and behaving atypically from his expectations. Yeah. Yeah. It's. It's very much a straightforward opposites attract uh, deal going on. Um, I, if we want to like move on to talk a little bit about Sajo, then um, so his name is Rihito. I've seen some people refer to him as Licht, as in like the German for light, but I have no idea if that's intentional or if it was just one person said it and then a bunch of people copied them. <laughs> uh, oh, I think that's in chapter three of the manga where he talks about where Hara Sensei talks about him being called Licht. Uh, yes. Uh, and that's where all of that comes from. So, by contrast, he's he's definitely the, um, even to his character design, it's a very straightforward um, Incho um, type. He's Yes. He's got the glasses, he's got the short black hair. There's an extra wrinkle to him, is that they've done a lot of, uh, quite well, not that subtle, they've done quite a few things to make him look constantly slightly ill mm-hmm. um like although his hair is in the sort of sensible cut quote-unquote sensible a lot of it is standing up in like um loose uh like clumps or strands uh, he's got these constant red marks around his eyes and he's much paler than everybody else i think the way i've i 
I described it when I was thinking to myself is he has that deer in the headlights look where <laughs> yes. when he's called by Chris Akabe initially in the classroom, like we, we look at his eyes and they're just kind of wide open staring at him with the bags kind of frozen, a little bit shaking. You can feel his nervousness just through his eyes. Yeah, it's, that's a very, that was a very good uh, description. And overall, um, like we, we get this anxiety uh, playing itself out in the, in the fourth part of the, of the film. Mm. But like the, we realize that we learn in the, in that chapter in that uh, section that this is in fact why he's at this particular boys' school because this isn't a high prestigious boys' school. It seems to be a pretty run of the mill private school. Uh, but it's like he has the grades. He's quote unquote famous among the teachers uh, to go to better places. But every time like he runs into these challenges for like exams or taking the train um he he just can't uh like bring himself to to do this and uh yeah. he's been failing exams and things as a result of this the other main thing about his character is really how is his relationship with kusakabe cuz that's what the film is all about i i think it's very fair to say that kusakabe is the aggressive one in the relationship he's the one who always pushes he's the one who first realizes his feelings and Saijo is an, uh, except until the very until the very end uh, where as Ian said he takes the lead for the first time he's always kind of being pulled along um by Kusakabe well a lot of the time he's like actively like semi rejecting it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. this is in, sort of interesting because to go back to the question we asked uh, about uh, Kusakabe is like does Sajo know he's gay? I think the implication is that he is that he knows because well we know Hara Sensei knows, or at least presumes. Yes. I'm not sure that like for him his reaction is like a sort of a rejection of the like, oh shit, what am I feeling? It's the oh wait, anyone is showing interest in me whatsoever. Yes. I also think it's not the rejection of, as you said, oh, I I'm in love with a boy, but it's I'm in love with this specific boy who is a very different type of person to me. And Harasensei and the classmates kind of stoke this further. Both of them indicate something along the direction of, oh, Kusakabe is a different person from you, Saijo is a different person. You're not the same kind of people. And eventually you'll just drift apart anyway, so why bother getting invested is kind of the idea. And I think really that's what's stopping him from getting heavily into the relationship. It's just a fear that eventually Saijo is gonna, uh, Kusakabe is going to change his mind, which is... We know is unfounded, but he doesn't. Yeah. In in, in the second uh, the second section, uh, when he is heard this um, overheard this conversation saying that like Sadio is a different genre, and they use that word. It was a hilarious choice of mm. word, but um, <laughs> like what they're saying is yeah, like yeah, he's a smart ass, uh, goody goody teacher's pet type. <laughs> and you play in a rock band, and you're like, a semi delinquent. Like the, I think the friend who oh, we'd learn his name in the credits, but it's never said. It's like Tanny or something. It's Tanny. He he's the one who keeps asking the question. It's just like, is there something between you two? And I and I was like, I, it's not. I, I guess I was a little unfair in the notes when saying it, but like it is like an early two thousands boy school where it's just the like, hey you, you and Sadio, eh? Have you been? Uh, <laughs> It's the like uh, school thing of oh those two are gay that's 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 different mm. like not openly homophobic but sort of quietly oh, that's odd sort of way yeah. like he doesn't feel it doesn't feel malicious it mostly just feels like like society hasn't taught him anything about this uh, this kind these kinds of relationships so he doesn't know what to do with it yeah like he mostly seems kind of supportive of it honestly like when they're together in the uh, in the hot springs he he doesn't get embarrassed until they start talking about love and stuff not the fact that he's in a relationship with a boy it's the lo- yeah. it's the oh you're in love kind of ah that's embarrassing rather than oh you're you're in lo- you're in love with a boy that's gross but- yeah and but i don't know if it's entirely fair but i feel um well like i'm saying is like they keep repeating this sort of a thing both with tani and with hara sensei uh, who i guess we can move on to talking about now uh. where this sort of the indication that there's like that boy ain't right. <laughs> Ara Sensei is the only character who looks like he belongs in in an air quotes yaoi manga. Oh, uh, we used the word. 
I, know. I, was, I was going to go the entire thing and never use that word. Ah. Uh, well, now you have to cut this out. I don't know. I feel like Sajo's in plenty of them. <laughs> like not 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 even <laughs> no, as, Sajo not, is. not even meaning like not even meaning like as a dojin, but just as like a character archetype. The Sajo's design is in a lot of BL stories. Like just off the top of my head, Sarah Samwai is literally a black head, pale guy with glasses and a longer blonde head outgoing person. So yeah, that's So Hara Sensei is the music teacher. He's gay. And we know this, but it doesn't seem like anyone on the staff or the students know this about him. Besides, of course, Saijo and Kusakabe. He's got a policy of not dating students. This is um, something that gets mentioned in the chapter three, which is not does not appear the chapter three of the manga, which does not appear in this film. He sure does push on the line, though. But, yeah, but like by the end of the second thing, he's just like, well. Time to make out with time to make out with my student. He's he's doing that thing that people do where it's just like, well, he's been dumped. Now is the time to make my move. Is it the predatory gate type rope? No. I mean it's predatory in a certain sense and that he's an adult yeah, and but it's uh, not I don't think it's really playing into the trope. No, maybe not, but like until that scene you could possibly read uh Chris Akabe's and Hara's interaction of Chris Akaba just misunderstanding Hara, uh, of just him misreading what he's actually saying, of the interest he's that the interest in showing in Saijo is just teacher student interest and nothing uh, personal. Until we get to that scene when he grabs him by the chin, takes off his, puts his cigarette in the bo- in Saijo's mouth, takes off his glasses, and then and then they're about to kiss until uh, Chris Akaba breaks in, beats him on the head until he bleeds, and then pulls Saijo out. Yeah, but the thing is, like, even like, after this point, he still has like a good relationship with them. Like, I mean, partly I guess because he doesn't know anyone else, but Kusakabe does go to him for advice, and he's at least reasonably willing to give it. He's the only gay adult he knows. <laughs> well, yeah. It, yeah, but it's still like it's not like he's just been like avoiding him for anything. Yeah. Uh, then again, he also has not been avoiding <laughs> Sajo, uh, which he probably should do a little bit more. I mean, could we read this as as him trying to play them so that they realize their own feelings? Probably not, but... I do think, though, that... Uh, I'm not sure if it's just me, but I think they make Hara more prominent uh, in the way he is framed in this OVA than he really appears in the manga. That is amazing to me, because I felt like he was barely present for most of it. Like It's weird, because like they cut out the scene where he, he meets Sajo at the beginning. Which I really understand because it's a massive flashback and just would have broken the flow of this movie. Okay, but it was also, but it was the first thing that got storyboarded. Yes, <laughs> and it good, and Which... it was the only thing that got cut. <laughs> well, you know, it happens when you're making things. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's just in I think the way like sometimes like the character focuses on him. I don't know. Me, me, like I say, maybe it's just me. I think what what you what it might be is that in the manga, Saijo is often in inside larger panels. I've noticed this occasionally, um, where the movie would take close up shots of larger panels. For example, there's a panel in episode one. Uh, it's where Saijo is, sit, uh, Chris, Saijo is sitting in the classroom, and when Kusakabe walks in on him, and in the manga it's a full body panel, but in the movie it zooms in specifically on his fingers and his neck. And I think that's what it might be in the manga. He's just in larger panels, so he kind of, seems kind of smaller and less impactful. Whereas in the movie, they chose to occasionally center in on him during those shots. I, I think it's. I think partly. I think I just. I just think this because although he's not a real character in the first chapter, he is still very much a huge presence when. Um, when Kusakabe is like saying to Sajo, just like, "Well, you were just doing this for Hara Sensei, weren't you?" And he does not. He does not say it like that. I wanted to ask, where do we think Kusakabe gets this idea from to begin with? That because uh, Sajo is in uh, in show, you know. Well, it's also because of the thing he says right at the beginning. It's just like, "I don't want to bother Hara Sensei." Yeah, and so he's just like, "Oh well, obviously you're just doing this to, you know, like." Be a teacher's pet. 
Chris Akabi's jealousy of Harrison is one of the driving things of the first few arcs. Uh, as we said during the summary, the fourth, the fourth chapter, Complex Full and Simplex Full, is basically the same thing, except this time we have a girl hitting on Kusakabe instead of Hara Sensei. And that, I feel like that further plays into Saijo's fear of, oh, he's eventually going to move on. He said yes to this girl, yes. accepting his number. He's also kind of drunk. so uh, And I feel like it might be the first time he's ever drunk alcohol. Cause, uh, for sure. Because uh, he goes to this club and it's like, ooh, uh, what do you want? And it's like, oh, I don't know. Uh, I guess I'll take what the guy before me had. And well, no, the guy. No, it's the guy behind him orders. Um, ah, yes. And the uh, bartender, I guess, gives him him the beer, and then he's like, oh, "What do you want?" Oh, I said beer. One thing I really, really liked about that scene, and I don't know if this is the intention of it, but you probably noticed the receptionist had black eyes, and she seemed very alien. And I definitely think that was an intended choice to make the atmosphere even more alienating to Saijo, who. We can all tell just massively feels out of place here in this rock underground club. So what do we think the like core theme of this film is? I mean, it's kind of, I don't want to say it's lame, but communication. <laughs> <laughs> the absolute most basic of themes. Because the, the big argument in chapters two, three, and four is simply that they don't communicate enough with each other, yes. and misunderstandings keep happening. Like Misakabe accidentally hears from Hara sense that Saijo is planning to go to Kyoto, and uh, is really angry that Saijo didn't tell him. Understandably, but Saijo is also angry that Kusakabe doesn't tell him. And then they have similar misunderstandings in class, and it just keeps happening. And once they actually just talk to each other honestly, everything see everything is fine. But beyond that, I think the real thing I only got out of this is, man, this is just a really vanilla love first love story. Because I, I I feel like the one thing that was really missing from this uh, film was the good times, so to speak. It's just like it's like we got we get the the, the how they meet together and then they're, they're together in like 10, 15 minutes, and then just four or five minutes of three fights, and I don't think that's a problem. Like a lot of like I feel like many manga sort of err on the other side, uh, whereas this is just like, where it's like, well, it's your first time falling in love. You're you don't know how this works. You're gonna get into arguments that could be resolved if you understood how to be adults but you're not adults so that's fine <laughs> yeah i i think i think partly i blame the fact that sorry that this prop this comes out in a quarterly magazine uh opera so it's just like well we need to give them something <laughs> like if you if you just if you just gave them the uh, which i also i think is the reason why they're done in seasons um so it's just like because it's if you just said, and here is the chapter where Kusakabe and Sajo go to the zoo and feed the pandas, like that might be all well and good. Um, but at the same time, you might be like, well, I waited three months for this. <laughs> you know what that sounds like, Ian? That sounds like a Yotsuba chapter. Yeah, but, but, but like everyone's coming to Yotsuba for her going and feeding the pandas. So I am. Um... <laughs> I think this is a story about uh, childhood's end and specifically framing it around a queer romance. And uh, I think this is best summed up by the um, hallucination that Sajo has on the uh, train, or I guess on the platform, where it's like, oh, we're tied together with a, well, they say lemon yellow, but it's yellow, string, uh, which is kind of the same color as uh, Kusakabe's hair. They do reference they do reference lemon yellow a lot. Like in the the flavored water is lemon flavored. Yep, it's almost like that's an intentional choice. Um, and yellow is quite it's well they say it's a summer color, but it's also sort of a youthful color. Um, you think about all the things IRL that are associated with like schools that are yellow, like American school buses, but also a lot of signage is um, so. Here we have, they're all tied together and like they're like having a little chat. And then uh, Kusakabi almost absent mindedly cuts the um, ribbon 
Uh, and Sasha was like, oh, God, why did you do that? <laughs> it was fine. And then uh, Sasha was like, well, uh, no, Kiss of Cabby's like, well, we can just retie it. Um, and it'll be this, uh, it'll be good. And it's like, but it won't be the same. And I think this is like the whole uh, film is like an, uh, the like anxieties about a uh, childhood relationship and all of the um, communication problems they have. Uh, but whereas uh, normally you might expect a story about uh, gay romance in schools to say, oh, well, this is just a fleeting childhood thing. Yes, <laughs> pretty um, much every day back. <laughs> class S, cough, cough. I mean, this, this is complicated. You know, people have different mm -hmm. feelings about this. But um, at the end, they reaffirm their like love for each other and that they will do better in the future. And at the end, uh, Kusakabi is able to be a supportive boyfriend for... Um, uh, Sajo as he's going into his exam, and it helps him a lot. So, and Sajo finally makes the first move, which he has not done. I don't think it's too much of a spoiler to say that they stay together for most of the uh, of the rest of the manga. So yeah. that we just have a serious gay relationship for most of it. So, I <laughs> I like it. it. The scene is very Ikahari, um, which is fine. <laughs> Um, there is no surprise in the amount of Ikuhara in this. <laughs> yeah, um, though I don't want to focus on him too much. Yeah, it's a good film. It was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Before we move on to animation, like, is there anything else we want to cover? Uh, just details or things we want to talk about? No, so uh, let's move on to the visuals. Uh, our director has said before, is uh, Shoko Nakamura, um, who has a career going back uh, a wee bit, uh, specifically. Okay, can I just be a little annoying here? There are yes. three. There are three Nakamuras involved with the production, <laughs> so we will need to keep saying what their names are. Yeah, Shoko. because because we have um, Shoko Nakamura as the director. Uh, we have uh, Chieko Nakamura for the art direction, and of course mm -hmm. uh, Asumiko. Nakamura is the manga author. <laughs> yeah. As said before, our director is uh, Shoko Nakamura, who um, has a career going back to sort of uh, early 2000s Gainax. Um, you will find um, cuts from her on the Boru from uh, Die Buster, uh, Garen Lagan, uh, you know, even Fooly Cooly, I think. And then has credits on a whole bunch of things like Mushishi or uh, even some One Piece. Um, so, but uh, I guess people would associate her for being the uh, chief director of uh, Mawaru Penguin Drum with uh, Ikuhara. Uh, so that's pretty important. Also, partly storyboarding this film and serving as chief animation director, which also means she did the character designs. Um, or adapted them, is Akemi Hayashi, who is also a early 2000s Gainax person, uh, and has also a, done a bunch of uh, Expo uh, shorts. So that's that's nice. Nakamura has quite a few uh, directorial quirks she uses, uh, the most obvious of which is the paneling, um, which I want to talk about, because uh, like there's a bunch of scenes that uh, use it really well. You see, the, this technique is in quite a few um, things, but it's really used as well as it is here. This is sort of where you take, like, um, you section off the film into little, I mean, I would say manga panels mm -hmm. or little windows um, to, like, focus in on stuff. What are, what are some good examples, folks? I mean, there's multiple moments uh, in which we just have one of our protagonists, Fonsky and Santa, then a panel slides in from the right or the left to indicate the passage of time, or to transition us to a different moment. My mm. favorite um, use of this is not, it's not actually a manga panel, but it's a moment where uh, the film also had the, like proper black, and, uh, black film borders at the top and at the bottom. And occasionally it plays around with those as well. So my favorite scene of the film is when those border borders turn vertical, and then they section off the majority of the screen, except Kusakabe, and then they squish him, and he like 
yes. pops like a balloon and it looks and it's just such a fantastic and charming little thing. My favorite paneling instance, I think, is after the kiss scene in the first chapter. It, where it's it's used to break up into sort of like rhythmic parts. Yeah. Um you, you know when they're when uh, musicians tell you it's not the notes you play, it's the notes you don't play. They're meaning like shut up at a shop for a second and like give us some time. Like they've got the, it, it introduces these rest moments that like well like they say they they give a rhythm to the scene that wouldn't otherwise be there. It would just be like eh, eh, eh. Yes. But no, you get boom, boom, boom. It's good. It's 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 quite funny. Like there's there's a, like quite a bunch of this sort of like um, rhythmic stuff, um, which I quite like, um, and it also makes me like feel kind of nostalgic for <laughs> like 1930s animation <laughs> when they when like they, when they would let's say it and like animate it to this to this beat, uh, which we don't really do these days because that's hard. But they did pay quite a lot of attention to the to the timing in general. Like there's a very good um, scene early on when uh, Harasen is playing the piano, for instance, and it's just it's just someone playing the piano, <laughs> but it's accurate piano playing. It's the right notes. It's at the right time, and it just adds like that little bit of extra to it. It was probably rotoscoped, but I couldn't say for certain. Uh, but it was it's good. still good. Yeah, rotoscoping isn't bad. Uh, yeah. Akron O'Hara is good, actually. Fuck you. <laughs> the anime. My only problem with Akron O'Hara... Well, I have several problems, but the main one is I keep confusing with Anne O'Hara, and that leads <laughs> to really confused looks when you talk to people. There's uh, another sort of odd uh, quirk of this film. So this comes from the manga more so, is the faces... Uh, Mm. So you sometimes see this in again uh, the I word <laughs> when they have the characters that have just have the blank faces, uh, and it's meant like to sort of indicate either like some sort of like conformity or just that they don't matter. It's slightly different here because the mouths are pretty much always there. It's just not, but not the eyes, which was kind of important during like the early saying scenes. But it, it's a choice. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, interesting to me because they're very selective about which minor characters have eyes or not. Like, in the third chapter, the person selling the tickets has, as Denny said, these like little uh, black eyes where they they haven't drawn the sclera, I guess. Um, the other person who actually has that unnoticed is um, Chris Akabi's bandmate, the singer. Yeah. The much more important character in that segment, the um, girl who, um, by comparison anyway, the girl who's uh, trying to ask him out and gets his number, does not have her eyes drawn. Um, so to me, it's obviously, <laughs> you could read it into a very a very long and good interview with the um, some of the creatives, the, both Hayashi and uh, Shoko Nakamura. Um, where they talk about, well, we kind of just adapted whichever faces were thrown straight from the manga. Uh, <laughs> we're not really thinking about it, which is, I mean, sure. Um, but I think the manga code must have put a lot of thought into it. I'm looking. I, 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 I've, I've only, I've only seen like Sete stuff for the main three characters, but I would be interested to see like Sete for this to see like, <laughs> all right, we need you to stick to these character designs and just like <laughs> they have like half a face. <laughs> It, um, it seems to me that the the um, they're sort of treating the eye. This is silly, but you know the old like the eyes are the window of the soul thing. Um, yeah, they've really went the opposite direction with that. Because, um, well, I I wouldn't say that actually because there's a scene when uh, Sajo is watching the band playing. Um, his mouth is not drawn, but his eyes are. Um, mm -hmm. Which I don't know. It sort of focuses you on what he's doing in that moment, or not doing, I guess, where he's at once both a blank and yet not. But I, I think the like I thing is like a kind of like um, showing which characters they feel alienated from, which is most mm -hmm. people. Like that. I mean, I assume that's why his friend has these kind of white eyes. They're still like he's closer to him, so he has eyes at least, but they're still. A barrier between them, so there's yeah. uh, they're not fully filled out. 
I mean, my favorite thing about the animation in this movie is the comedic animation specifically, because it really reminds me of old school 90s style comedy animation. There's a lot of stretchiness and bounciness um, in there. Ian described the people as clamp noodle people. They all have very long arms. They have very round legs. They all walk bow-leggedly. There's a lot of other stuff, like there's sweat drops uh, like in the air when they're running. There's uh, thought bubbles that occasionally pop up, jump cuts used for comedy, characters doing extreme poses. And I, I just thought it worked really well here in the limited uh, amount of times it was used. There's a very important scene, uh, the one where Kusakabe breaks in, breaks in, uh, stumbles into the uh, almost smooch. And that one is uh, keyed by uh, Hayashi. And it's all over the place in a good way, <laughs> uh, I think I would say. Because it starts off as being like quite serious. And then like when he goes to punch him, he just sort of like crab walks up and re- like reverse hooks him. <laughs> and there's there's a lot of this in the um in the show where it's just like they have they they do have like an aesthetic, but their their aesthetic relies on a certain inconsistency to like throw you. Yeah, we haven't mentioned the backgrounds at all, but it's they they they're like watercolors with like a really dark blues and greens and a yeah. I don't, I don't want to say like traditional Japanese sort of um, hokusai style, but like the color choices have the, that sort of quality to them. There's a lot of like uh, high contrast too, because sometimes they'll make the background uh, completely white. In the moments where Sajo is feeling most anxious, they'll do this thing where the top of the frame, uh, the background is completely white, but then the bottom sort of fades into this like increasingly deeper blues, almost like the paint has like dripped to the bottom <laughs> and collected <laughs> there, which I think works quite well because it's almost like he's sinking into it. I feel like they also use that occasionally when he's not... It, I feel like it's not always associated with his anxiousness because we do have that very nice moment where they're working together with the umbrella and that also uses that everything is white and there's a little bit of blue at the bottom. He's pretty uncomfortable in that scene. Yeah, I, I, I was never quite sure like how to interpret like all of those like um, pure white scenes. Um, like you, you're saying is is like a sort of as like a, an anxiety reflection, as in a like. Well, no, no, no. I'm I'm not I'm not talking about the pure white scenes. I'm talking okay. about where they like split it between pure white and like this um, blue. messy blue. Because yeah. like they do often just go like pure white. Um, yes, and. It's like I was trying to think like why we do this in live action theater, and the, the place that we always go to it is in like heavenly scenes, <laughs> and so it was just like, but I can't see like that sort of applying uh, here unless you're thinking of it like purely as like a, a, this is a nostalgic lens, like this is a halcyon days of high school. Like what 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 do you think? There's definitely something to that because it's. Uh, they only really do it when there's like important confessions, like the goofy Ichiban scene. Um, you're my number one, where the uh, <laughs> like it's a, a important moments of connection is when it happens, mm-hmm. uh, where the whole world just fades away and it's just them. So yeah. Well, one thing I wanted to talk about is the cameras and uh, the framing in the anime. It's all over the place. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is indeed all over the place. Most of the anime you think is is fine. There's not it's the characters aren't very heavily sexualized. Except of course when they are in like three or four specific shots. There's the shot when uh Kusakaba first sees Sajo in the room. As I already said, we zoom in on his hands and we zoom in on his neck, and that is definitely like meant to be looked at in a sexual way. Sexy, sexy hands. Sexy sexy neck. Then there's the bit in episode two uh, with uh, Hara Sensei when he grabs him by the chin, and then there's the then there's a bunch of tongue kisses in like uh, chapters three and four where we all where we see the tongues animated. That did look a bit weird. That you you know this this animator, mm-hmm. Denny. Uh, well, <laughs> not not just you, Denny. Like when I tell you that. 
they're the one that does the running scene in Perfect Blue or the stairwell scene in Tokyo Godfathers. Oh. Or, or a whole chunk of Evangelion. Now, this is um, uh, Takeshi Honda, another Gainax alum. It's amazing like that he's been like working so long and just like he like he's like got such like a good range, but because it's like, well, who do you get to animate this like boys love si- boys love scene? It's just like, well, we didn't go to like <laughs> like a BL specialist. We just got like this really good animator. We're just like, here, I want you to like draw some guys kissing and uh, having their spines fondled, and he's and he's did a really well, good job. Presumably, they they knew him. Well, yeah, this is what I'm saying. It's just like, but it's like, I feel like it's almost like a power move having Takeshi Honda <laughs> on your production. I mean, I don't know why these scenes didn't bother me. I felt like they, I felt like they were too almost like silly to be entirely fetishistic. Yeah, there's also there was there was a level of intimacy to those shots that made it not as voyeuristic to me. Even though it can't possibly be from the perspective of either character. <laughs> the only one I felt to be a little bit voyeuristic was the Hara scene. But the first one I didn't have a problem with because, as you said, this is, at least in part, a movie about two kids like discovering their first love and sexuality. So it makes yeah. fun. It's perfectly reasonable for some scenes to be framed in a more sexual manner, especially when they're the ones who's, who are currently experiencing it. It deepens our understanding of the characters if the camera represents what they're feeling yeah like i mean what we were talking about before we got a little bit distracted was like the camera work and it's a very um confident use of it Mm -hmm. like you see this with like a certain some directors where it's just like you you know you you can have two people talking and you need to do shot reverse shot and it's just like eh, let's not do that here let's just cut away to the background or like only show half of their face or like have the camera frame behind one or a thing they would often do is pull it right back to like a very like extreme what's the opposite of a close up <laughs> uh a wide shot yeah, no cuz no, it's not cuz it's not like wide cuz it's still focused it's just far away <laughs> a lean out um, no. <laughs> a, lean, a lean out we'll go with that um and like i felt like while i don't want to say that it was the the camera was voyeuristic cuz i've just argued that it wasn't it did feel like a fly on the wall to a certain extent. Like, like I said, like I say, it's not voyeuristic in the sense that we're not like leering, but we do feel like we've stumbled into a, into an intimate moment. Yeah. I think the most that feels like that is the one that's the shot through the school window, uh, yeah. where they're kissing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Since we've already talked a lot about the animation, all I want to say is the hair is really difficult. <laughs> how, yes. di- how difficult was it to get the hair right? Well, they had to get the manga author to to <laughs> correct some of the frames. She actually talked about it in in, her, in the uh, in the manga about like like having to like have phone calls just about how to get his hair right because <laughs> it's it's really detailed like like volumey hair and yeah. uh, like one of the things I think Hayashi Pot says is that if you drew it like the way you normally did, it would like look like too much, and so you would need to like cut bits off here and there. It is very good hair, I have to say. The final detail I want to mention is this isn't this really isn't important at all, but I did the work, so I want to talk about it. So in the middle of the movie, or towards the end of the movie, we have a scene in which Kusakaba is hanging out with his friend at home and his friend is playing a video game. There's actually a really good shot in there as well where the camera is placed inside the TV. Uh-uh. And no. No. It's no. right in front of the TV. <laughs> Yeah, huh? you you. If you look at it, because we can read what's on the screen, we're not seeing it through the screen. We're seeing it yeah. from the front. So, in fact, the camera has to be invisible and in front of Tani, but in between. Him oh, and the so it's a reflection. Yes. It's a reflection. <laughs> ah, I get it's it. something you literally can't do in live <laughs> action. Yeah, this was something we were th- we we did actually talk about. We were thinking about what video game he was playing on his X Boy. On his X Boy, because the console. It's clearly an Xbox or X Boy. He's using the Duke controller, so that means early 2000s. He's playing a side scrolling shoot 'em up or shmup. The game is called Anaconda and some Japanese title that I can't read. I think it just said Anaconda. It was published by Onami, which is definitely Konami, also using the red and yellow logo, the logo they used to use at that time. So, based on everything I could find, based on the games they released at, around that time and the shmups released at that time, 
he must be playing either Gradius 3 or 4, with me leaning more towards 4, because just graphically it looks more, uh, it looks very similar to it. The other weird bit about that is when he selects new game, it uses a very distorted version of the Mario coin noise, but it's still recognizable. Right, which t- leads us into talking about the sound, because honestly, I felt like we were never going to get here if we really needed to. But like, this is just a very rich visual film. Like, I'm actually disappointed that Sakuga Boru, or well, Sakuga Blog hasn't talked more about it, because when you search for Dokusei on their site, it's just like, and here's your monthly reminder to watch Dokusei. And it's just like, ah, but you didn't tell us about Dokusei, you jackasses, because you were talking about the seasonal stuff, and that was interesting too. Yeah, and fucking you, uh, Kevin on Twitter has talked about it a bunch of times. Yeah. <laughs> he was constantly telling people to watch it. Anyway. I mean, I think that's what we're doing. We're telling people to watch it. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There is a composer, but he's also the person playing all the music, I think. Uh, I, that might be true. Uh, I It was hard to check. And uh, that is uh, guitarist Kotaro uh, Oshio, who is... Uh, Relatively famous. He was voted the second greatest Japanese guitarist in 2019. Who was who was was first? Like it was probably just going to be like the guy from X Japan or something. Because let me see if I can translate this page. Because popular people are popular. (laughs) Uh, Some guy called Char C H A R. Okay. I think he's responsible for all the music in this, uh, except for maybe the choir song. There are a lot of um, musicless scenes, but when it does show up, it's usually to like punctuate an important moment. He has a very particular way of playing the um, guitar. He's doing a lot of finger picking, and like I, I don't really have the language to describe the way he's playing, but it's very distinctive. Um, the, this, uh, to me, I think that the way the music goes actually is meant to like reinforce the scenes, as is a lot of the um, Foley choices. Yeah. So, for example, where's my notes? These little arpeggios that he does. I would say that like it, it's a bit like he it's it's always like like micro sections of music. Yeah. Um, like it's here's a short melody. It's not, and I'm just gonna like. Str- uh, like have a, like a, a vamp in the background. Yeah. Whereas when it got into autumn, it was like less guitar and more the high keys in the piano, and they were played yeah. very staccato. I would say this film, like, is very been has been very opinionated about its art, but it was uh, it was also very opinionated about its music. And like I already said about these sorts of beats that it was doing with the animation, I feel like it was very careful about how it used silence. And most of the music, most of the sounds in this movie are just the regular sounds that you would expect if you lived in a in a city. Yeah, so there's cicadas in the summer because it's Japan. In autumn, there's a lot of rain. You get crowds and stuff. But I, to me, there's it's used not as like an effect, but as like a white noise. Yes. In the, it's supposed to be uninteresting, so you don't pay attention to it, and it also kind of focuses you on the words that are being said. They've like very much attempted to have very similitude with the sounds, uh, sound design for the most part, uh, to the point where they went and uh, did a bunch of Foley recordings in an actual boys' school. So I guess all that chatter you hear in the background is actual chatter. Like there, there are some like big pieces of music and like nice effects, like when the band is playing and he just opens the door, and then like the way it's mixed, it just sort of like, it just sort of like yeah, that was good. It sort of like wafts into you, like like you're you're being hit by it as you would when you open the door. There was like another part where like the music is playing and it like how you have like it's like you have tunnel vision but with your ears. Yes. <laughs> Again, like. We, we need more vocabulary for this. Well, Freya has some. I have less. Denny has none. <laughs> no offense. <Denny. laughs> sound existed and it was fine. <laughs> God, I hate you. The only sound I specifically noticed was during the comedic animation when Kusakabe, twice Kusakabe slides across the ground like he kind of floats and they use that. I don't know what instrument it is, but it's the... The slide whistle? No, the wooden rivet tube and you... Put like a wooden stick over it and goes. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a slide whistle, isn't it? No, 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 no. It's a, no, it's a, it's a, it's a percussion instrument. 
it, like in my school, it was a fish, and you would rub the drums. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, for us, it was a was, it was a frog. <laughs> yeah, okay, I know what you mean. But yeah, that they use that to make to achieve like a sound, and that's all. That's really the only like instrument thing that I noticed. Specific. Well, I did feel that the acoustic guitar music reminded me at least a little bit of Aria or Yokohama. Uh, yeah, it felt like those bit. could have been could have been played in there. So I liked it. There's some similar. Um, he, again, his playing is quite different from the way the Choro Club plays uh, in Aria, but you know. Yeah, I, I, it's definitely they, like the. It, but I, I think this it's the, the same thing that we said when we talk about Aria or when we talk about Yokohama. It's not like who's doing it. It's that the it's the fact that there has been like such a thoroughly well executed vision. Of what, yeah, uh, <laughs> vision was the wrong word, but uh, audio vision, audio vision uh, of what they want from this. So I think the last sort of music we should talk about is the the choir song, which they are singing at the first section. That is, uh, the lyrics are written by um, Asumiko Nakamura, the manga author. The arrangement is done by, as far as I can tell anyway, uh, Tomoyuki Nakamura from a chiptune band of all things, uh, CM, uh, YMCK. I don't, I, I don't know how I felt about this song. I did like the way that they managed to make a distinction between like Harasen when he's talking, when he's going, th- when he's leading them through the first time and he's giving this like re- re- relatively soulful performance. That's like quite high pitched. Uh, this is one of the advantages of uh, Hideo Ishikawa is that he has quite a good range. He's typecast for lower voiced, but he's he can go high as well. All whereas I don't know if they just used the staff members. I assume they must have done, but like to like fill in the background voices of the guys, and they're all just like, <laughs> yeah. Um, but like they do get better over time, and like. It's good that they did that. They must. They they had to have recorded this like several times. That like, all right, we want you to be really bored here, and we want you to be really like good at it here. You know who isn't great at singing? Kamiya Hiroshi. Uh, <laughs> well, He's okay. He was okay. I wouldn't have like. I wouldn't have said that his singing was great. His performance is good though. I I liked it. I think that of the three characters we've talked about the most. Um, he is the most easy to tell in his performance. Yes. Um, like, if you if you know like who like Aragi in the Monogatari series is, or like Psyche K, or to a slightly lesser extent Zetsuo Sensei, um, they're all kind of variations on the same performance, and he gives a very even delivery. That's uh, I I don't know how to do it. It's like I I described it in my notes as like a stage whisper like at normal volume <laughs> where it's very breathy I, I think i think like his s's give him away a lot no no i can't do it he also yells yells a lot as most of those people <laughs> yeah he's done a lot less yelling in this in this one or at least a, a different kind of yelling um, yes slightly less comedic it's still comedic so with all like oh, like I'm actually kind of exhausted talking about this show like not in a bad way but you know uh so we should move on and sort of give what we think uh are is are going to be our grades so Denny how many kisses on the cheek <laughs> I was thinking about that while we were talking about it and I realized I haven't really said a single bad thing about it <laughs> which is why I'm going to start now <laughs> Yeah, uh, I actually hated it all along. I just thought it was very good. It was very consistent. I liked most of the characters, but Harasensi, but he played his role perfectly. The misunderstandings were fine. It was it was a vanilla Roman story, but it was a very good one. I don't know. Is this a five? <laughs> is it a five just because there was nothing I liked about it? <laughs> <laughs> no, is it a five because there was nothing I liked about it? <laughs> is it a five because there was nothing I disliked about it? Is this on the same level as Yokohama? I, I don't know. See, like for the, the Yokohama for me is a five because I liked everything about it. This yeah. is a four and a half 
because I want. I some agree. <laughs> I agree. Like that, that's my thinking as well. I like. Oh, you see, I I I wouldn't give something I liked everything about it a five. I would give five to things that are really good, but also have maybe big problems. I mean that 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 too, of course. But I just think I'm, I'm going to give this a four a four and a half out a uh, four and a half out of five. I did give Yokohama a five, though. We all gave it a five. Yes, because it was very good. Well, the first two of were yeah, that's excellent. what yeah, that's what we're talking about. The, like the the main problem I have with it is it's a little samey. There's like four chapters, three of which are both here's a misunderstanding. Let's have the misunderstanding, let it play out, and then let's make up. There's a more meat to the last one, and I think one minor one would be done. But I think like for five, we need to have a little bit more like of just the the happy times. Mm. Just could just to set that just to push it into the into the into the the high marks. I do think the like repetitive structure is sort of on purpose because you know they can't <laughs> they can't get better until they change. That's yeah, that's fair. The thing is, all the happy times are like kind of short and mostly expressed through vi- visuals and also kissing a lot of the time, which is maybe you know whatever. I do think we could have had the more like hanging out, hanging out. The bike scene is good. Uh, what do I want to give it? Man, I hate to be samey, but... You could change it, like, <laughs> four kisses in the hand <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking at the beginning. I don't know, it's just solid, but solid in, like, a kind of exceptional way. It's really well directed, the animation is often great, and they play around with it a lot, and it... I don't know, it tells its relatively, quote-unquote, Simple story. Well, I think the biggest problem with this is it's not Yokohama. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not remotely trying to do the same thing. Oh, so it's, that's a exactly. bad comparison. <laughs> it's a ter- it's a terrible comparison, but it's just like, yeah, this isn't. Yeah, it's like it's good. I really like it, but it's just like you haven't really got on my wavelength. <laughs> I mean, they, um, my one like slight thing I feel weird about is Harris Sensei, but that's just because I don't know how to feel. I feel about him. He's just kind of there. He does some weird, uh, low key student teacher romance stuff. Um, but he also exists as a queer adult, and that's nice. That doesn't happen that often in anime. Four and a half kisses. A half kiss is disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> that's the one where you don't use the time <laughs> <laughs> yes those I don't know those could be okay yeah okay do we have any fun facts yes I've actually got two so the band's name uh, in which Chris Cabo plays is Zgok which is a Gundam reference their logo in the manga is also the Zgok eye um, it's the classic like Zaku single eye on a black visor that goes left to right. This also means that the mustached adult man we see at some points uh, in the episode... Yeah, he appears twice, and he's one of the only background characters with eyes. That just 100% convinces me that he's a Ramba Bal reference, which is a character in the first Gundam. The only weird thing is that he doesn't pilot a a Zgok, he pilots a Goof, but that's neither here nor there. Um, But somebody who worked on this really liked Gundam. Gundam is in everything. (laughs) The other bit of trivia I have is that the fact that Dokusei shares its name with the first ever dating sim from 1992, which is called Dokusei. A person I follow on Twitter is talking about those recently, which was bad timing. Yeah, uh, like th- this was this was going to be my fact, but then I thought it was, le- but but only I think because I didn't realize like that it was a that it was like a a forerunner of the more more uh, of the dating sim, and yeah. like if I and I felt that the the link seemed a bit more tenuous when you remember that the TV series like the OVA stuff is called Kakuse, mm. and like <laughs> well, which is like a lower classmate. I started this uh, episode off with a poem. That poem is from the collection, 100 po- it's 100 Poems, uh, the Ogura Hyakunin Ishu. We've got to watch the anime about that at some point. Which you might know because it's the basis for the card game Karuta, 
and everybody except for me loves Chihaya Fruit. <laughs> 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 and I wouldn't have looked into this at all except for the scene when like like he's spending all the time trying to figure out like what's the second half of what's what's the rest of this poem? And then um Sajo says to him, it's like, well the second half is more famous. And then I was like Wait, <laughs> uh, and then yeah, sure enough, it's uh, it's a car. It's because it's uh, the it's the poems used in Karuta. Also, Hokusai did a series of prints based on the Hundred Poets Hundred Poems, and we talked about Miss Hokusai in another episode. Check that out. Another solid film that we all rated quite well at the end. Mm. So, Ian, what are we watching next time? Uh, we're going to do something unusual and watch something all of us have seen. Um, so we're going to watch They Were Eleven, the um, the film of the Motu Hagio manga. I don't remember anything about that film, so I'll just treat it as if I'd never seen it. I'll remember a few things. We are the Anime Research Group, a uh, bi-weekly podcast coming out on Thursdays, sometimes. Uh, if you'd like to tell us what you thought of the episode or suggest something for future episodes, you can follow us on Twitter at research underscore anime or drop us an email at researchanime at gmail.com. Goodbye. Tell a friend. Goodbye. Like, subscribe, ring the bell. And smash that bell. And watch Dokusei. <laughs> and watch Dokusei.